A lot of countries have nuclear weapons. Even more countries could have nuclear weapons if they wanted to. Considering you only need a few to make your country pretty much uninvadable, it's kind of a wonder the list is so short. Taiwan is one of those countries where you can definitely see why they might want a nuke. They've got the strategic need and the economic ability with the technical know-how to pull it off, and they nearly did. Taiwan's desire for a nuclear weapon emerged shortly after the nationalist government's retreat to the island following their defeat in the Chinese Civil War. Chiang Kai-shek, the military dictator who ruled the island for the decades immediately following the war, saw having his own nukes as necessary to balance against the Sino-Soviet nuclear cooperation happening on the mainland. Under the American Atoms for Peace program, Chiang embarked on this project in the early 1950s as civilian nuclear energy research initially. Chiang at the same time repeatedly asked the United States to station nuclear weapons on Taiwan, a request that was eventually granted after a few years of badgering. The amount of nuclear weapons on Taiwan peaked around 200 sometime in the 1960s. From the start, nuclear research on Taiwan was closely tied with the military. The Institute on Nuclear Science, founded in 1956 supposedly for peaceful research, was mainly attended by military officers. Hundreds of Taiwanese officers were also sent abroad, mainly to the United States and Western Europe to study nuclear physics and technology. Taiwan's Tsinghua University would also receive a research reactor from the United States, which Chiang personally visited a few times. Most of the people running the reactor were military men secretly gathering information that could eventually be used to make a bomb. Taiwan really stepped up these efforts after the People's Republic unexpectedly tested a nuclear bomb of their own in 1964. Most international observers believed they were still years off from one, and this sent Chiang and the rest of the Taiwanese government into total panic. The U.S. still had a defense treaty with Taiwan at this time, and Chiang attempted to leverage that to convince them to launch a preemptive strike against all nuclear installations on the mainland. Considering we're all still alive, that didn't happen, but it did make Chiang go into overdrive with his nuclear program. The U.S. became concerned Taiwan was working on one in 1965, when some visiting International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, officials were asked out of the blue if they had a 200 megawatt reactor lying around. This came shortly after America learned Taiwan was in secret talks with West Germany to acquire a reactor from them as well. Why a country suddenly became this interested in nuclear tech right after their rival across the strait tested a nuke was fairly obvious. The CIA was able to correctly determine that Taiwan would have to import everything needed for a bomb, so efforts at stopping them mainly consisted of talking to potential foreign partners and telling them not to sell anything. Chiang had to slow the program to appease the US and signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty, pledging not to build a nuclear weapon. The real objective of making that declaration was to make other countries less hesitant about selling them civilian nuclear equipment which they could reuse for military purposes. Canada supplied Taiwan with a small, heavy water moderated research reactor, allowing Taiwan to, at least in theory, produce their own plutonium by reprocessing spent fuel. A new body was established to run this reactor, the Chengshan Institute of Science and Technology, under the Ministry of Defense in 1969. Construction of the reactor was quickly spotted by American satellites, and the issue was brought up to the IAEA. The IAEA imposed safeguards on the reactor when it was completed in 1973, but these weren't stringent enough to prevent it from being used to aid in building a bomb. Though, increased oversight meant that Taiwan had to diversify and had to start building more sites to hide nuclear materials from international auditors. The United States successfully blocked most large purchases of nuclear equipment, but smaller pieces slipped through the cracks. American diplomats in the early 70s uncovered secret negotiations between Taiwan and various suppliers of fuel reprocessors in Europe, only further raising concerns about Taiwan's desire for a nuke. A CIA investigation estimated that Taiwan could have a nuke ready by 1976 if they kept on their current pace. A team of U.S. officials was sent to Taiwan to essentially issue an ultimatum, give up on nuclear weapons or American military aid would be halted. The visiting Americans also noticed how Taiwan's nuclear research facilities seemed to have unlimited funds available, as evidenced by the large amount of waste and superfluous equipment present. The Taiwanese government pledged to the visitors that their interest in nuclear technology remained for peaceful, civilian use only. The officials left with the correct impression that Taiwan wasn't really hearing them, but at least they were now informed of the potential consequences for proceeding with weapons development. The IAEA was still monitoring Taiwanese nuclear facilities, but their inspections and safeguards were consistently able to be defeated easily. For example, the IAEA installed security cameras at the site of Taiwan's research reactor, but these often didn't work. The ones that did work were predictable, and it was possible to tell when they would take a picture by listening with a stethoscope. Must have been a really slow day at work when they figured that one out. Despite the US and IAEA efforts to stop Taiwan, they slowly but surely increased their nuclear capability, even as power shifted from Chiang Kai-shek to his son Chiang Ching kuo the exact timeline here is quite messy, as Taiwan still officially denies ever having a nuclear weapons program and most American documents about it are still classified, but according to a declassified U.S. memorandum, Taiwan completed the preliminary design work for a nuclear bomb in September 1975 and could have one built in three years, hypothetically. 
The IAEA continued making disturbing discoveries. On one inspection of the research reactor, they discovered a secret laboratory used for making plutonium metal, something rarely, typically never, used on civilian sites. When the IAEA asked to inspect the supposedly small, experimental-only quantity of plutonium metal made here, they discovered much of it couldn't be accounted for and never got a straight answer as to what it was being used for. The United States did figure out where it was going, however. A clandestine American monitoring site set up near Taiwan's main nuclear research facility detected fission products in the air on at least three separate occasions. This confirmed Taiwan was reprocessing fuel into plutonium, though the measurements weren't precise enough to pinpoint the exact location. America didn't wish to show its hand, and had this information leaked to the media anonymously so the issue could be brought up as a problem to resolve rather than an accusation. Reluctantly, Taiwan agreed to more thorough inspections of nuclear sites by a team of American inspectors in early 1977. The team, when they arrived, was subjected to, uh... The inspectors found much of Taiwan's reprocessing facilities dismantled or destroyed, making sample taking difficult. They examined nuclear waste records, finding multiple recorded spills of nuclear material that had fission products within them. Inspectors also found many inconsistencies in the actual designs of their nuclear facilities from what had been reported to the IAEA. This was combined with more discrepancies related to nuclear fuel Taiwanese officials couldn't account for or explain. The U.S. team visited many sites the Taiwanese government didn't expect them to know about, likely being informed of their locations by CIA assets within the nuclear program. What exactly they found still isn't clear, but the conclusion was reached that Taiwan was indeed building nuclear weapons and lying to the IAEA. The new U.S. president, Jimmy Carter, now with strong evidence as to Taiwan's intentions, formally demanded an end to the nuclear program. Taiwan, by this point, did have a large, legitimate civilian nuclear industry and was relying on American nuclear fuel for its power plants. Carter simply threatened to cut off the supply of energy if Taiwan didn't agree to American demands. Taiwan had no options but to agree to the demands, which they did in still classified communications. This resulted in the research reactor being shut down abruptly, with the scientists working there being told it was for maintenance. Taiwan was forced to shut down all uranium enrichment and heavy water producing facilities and would work with the United States to retool these facilities for civilian purposes. All U.S. origin plutonium was shipped off to Los Alamos and American officials would stay in Taiwan to make sure they couldn't restart any fuel reprocessing facilities. The research reactor would be limited to using low enrichment uranium, greatly reducing the amount of potential plutonium it could produce. Many officials in Taiwan were undeterred by this setback and wished to maintain a nuclear capability under the guise of civilian programs. The military was resentful of being forced to accede to American demands and worked at eroding the agreement Taiwan had struck with the United States. American intelligence assets embedded in Taiwanese nuclear facilities reported continued uranium enriching activities, something strictly against the agreement. Heavy water production continued as well. When American officials asked to inspect the places this was happening, they were brought on meandering tours of unrelated facilities in the north when this work was actually being done in the south. This led to more demarches and a heated confrontation between Chiang Ching Kuo and the U.S. ambassador to Taiwan. Chiang insisted Taiwan was adhering to the agreement, though he admitted some enrichment activity had taken place. Nuclear weapons development was resumed more formally after President Carter abruptly ended the U.S.-Taiwan Mutual Defense Treaty, replacing it with the Taiwan Relations Act. Hawks and the Taiwanese government demanded the country use its plutonium stocks for building nukes, as they still had enough left over to build a few low-yield devices. But for the time being, Taiwan did not make any more firm steps towards a nuclear weapon in the 1970s. In June 1980, Taiwan made a request through the new American Institute in Taiwan, the replacement for the U.S. Embassy in Taiwan, for various basic equipment related to civilian nuclear energy. The United States, now very wary of any requests by Taiwan for anything nuclear, took until October to approve the request. The delay made many in the Taiwanese government nervous about America's reliability as a partner. In early 1981, the research reactor restarted, and CIA informants within the program leaked that the situation was changing rapidly. In 1982, as part of warming relations between the U.S. and People's Republic on the mainland, the U.S. agreed to slightly reduce arms sales to Taiwan over the course of a few years. Chiang was upset by this and declared that Taiwan was in fact developing nuclear weapons, a statement quickly walked back by the rest of the executive branch. The research reactor was restarted using fuel that could have easily been reprocessed into plutonium. In theory, according to Taiwan's agreement, this should have all been sent to the United States to prevent this, but only a small amount was sent. Taiwanese leadership justified this by declaring the agreement only prohibited actually assembling nuclear weapons and, according to the actual wording, wasn't technically prevented from experimenting with nuclear material or designing nuclear weapons. Developing missiles and delivery systems for a nuclear device also wasn't technically forbidden. Behind the scenes, the military regained much of its control of Taiwanese nuclear energy, now carefully using civilian officials as fronts to placate the U.S. They worked secretly to get the weapons program back on track and increasingly reoriented research towards that end. In 1982, a deal was struck between Taiwan and apartheid South Africa where the two would help each other's secret nuclear programs. Taiwan would provide expertise and technical assistance in exchange for South African uranium. 
The two also agreed to jointly develop chemical enrichment methods, something Taiwan was strictly forbidden from doing by their agreement with the United States. This saw modest progress and gave Taiwan a potential way to enrich their own uranium without outside help. South Africa also agreed to help set up an additional small reactor on Taiwan, giving a potentially easy way to evade the oversight of the U.S. America caught wind of this secret work and demanded in early 1984 to inspect Taiwanese nuclear facilities again, which they were permitted to do. The exact events here are still mostly classified, but we know there was some internal discussion among Taiwanese leadership about breaking off the nuclear deal with the U.S. entirely. This didn't happen, and the partnership with South Africa was instead terminated a short time later. Taiwan's hot cells were another point of contention. Hot cells are these little radiation-shielded chambers, typically used for handling and experimenting with radioactive material. Taiwan had a set of these hot cells that were able to both process irradiated fuel and separate plutonium, which concerned the U.S. The explanation for their existence was for use in the creation of molybdenum-99, which has legitimate uses in medical technology. In reality, they existed so Taiwanese scientists could get experience using hot cells, experience that could be used to extract large amounts of plutonium. The U.S. demanded these hot cells be shut down, viewing them as a violation of the agreement. It isn't clear if they were shut down after this. Taiwanese military leaders were growing frustrated with the perceived dictatorial control the United States had over what was, in their eyes, a domestic scientific program. As shown with South Africa, Taiwan wasn't blind to the need to reach out to foreign countries to advance their own program. A few countries were considered. First, France. France has a large, very experienced, and well-equipped nuclear industry, making a potential partnership very attractive for Taiwan. Early talks were cut short when France informed Taiwan they wouldn't be willing to sell much beyond only the most basic of nuclear tech to a country considered a proliferation risk like Taiwan. Israel was also considered another country with a clandestine nuclear program. While Israel did have some interest, the Israeli government decided it would be rocking the boat too much with the United States and didn't proceed with any deals with Taiwan. Saudi Arabia was also contacted under the guise of peaceful nuclear cooperation. Saudi Arabia was considering making their own nukes, but were described by Taiwanese officials as overestimating their own abilities. Ultimately, it was decided that neither side could be of much use to the other, especially considering the inevitable U.S. intervention Saudi Arabia would face. Throughout the 80s, Taiwan was alarmed by the modernization of the People's Liberation Army happening on the Chinese mainland. Military leadership set the goal of Taiwan being able to produce a nuke on six months' notice at most, so one could be ready in time for a hypothetical Chinese invasion. Again, this wasn't seen as violating the demand not to make nuclear weapons, they were only preparing to make them. The plan was to be able to have a nuke ready before China or America learned about it, then rapidly build more so it would essentially be a fait accompli. Nuclear infrastructure would need to be stepped up to allow for this rapid production, something they estimated could be completed by 1989 or so. There were several problems with this plan. 1. How exactly would they use a nuke if they got one? Taiwanese ballistic missile development had been stalled and defunded for a few years now, and no plane in the Air Force's inventory could carry one. Second, making sure their design would work. Taiwan was still technically bound by the Partial Test Ban Treaty, meaning they couldn't test one in the ocean. Taiwan's dense population also made an underground test unfeasible. Third, they still didn't have enough uranium or plutonium. A large amount of either of these materials heading to Taiwan in a short time would be obvious. Even if they did get it, Taiwan never developed hot cells sophisticated enough to turn them into usable components for a nuclear weapon. Lastly, personnel. Taiwan had many smart and capable nuclear scientists, but basically none knew that building a bomb was a goal. How exactly do you build a nuke in three months when nobody knows that's even something they're supposed to know how to do? While Taiwan did have some plutonium on hand and could get more from their research reactor, it generally wasn't weapons grade. Exact numbers are hard to say, but they could have likely cobbled together a few small nuclear devices with their available plutonium supplies. Still, the US and IAEA inspections would remain a constant problem. IAEA inspections only came every three to six months and could likely be delayed at least once or twice without raising too much suspicion. This would be enough time to divert fuel away for reprocessing before anything would be noticed. To this end, a new secret reprocessing plant was built, designed to be deliberately hard to spot from satellite images. The existence of this site was revealed to the United States via intelligence assets within the program. The official explanation was again that it was for legitimate medical uses. When asked later by the IAEA why it was on a secret military base, Taiwanese officials relented and admitted that it was for plutonium production. Around 1987, experiments with regular high explosives had progressed to the point the program could begin finalizing the design for a nuclear bomb. The only way they could reasonably deliver this hypothetical bomb would be mounted inside a drop tank of a plane. President Reagan had paused advanced arms sales to Taiwan in the early 80s, hoping to build a better relationship with the People's Republic on the mainland. While Taiwan wouldn't be getting any F-16s, foreign companies were still allowed to provide technical assistance to the island. This assistance would be used to launch Taiwan's indigenous defense fighter program. Many of the same people involved in the nuclear program worked on the plane, what would ultimately be known as the FCK-1 Ching Kuo, named after the president. Two unfortunate acronyms there. 
The goal was for the plane to have a range of a thousand kilometers while carrying a nuclear weapon, but considering an external fuel tank would need to be sacrificed, this was an unrealistic goal. Any attempt to drop a nuke on the mainland would have almost certainly been a suicide mission for the pilot. The primary bottleneck for Taiwan's nuclear ambitions remained the means of delivery. But that wouldn't be a problem Taiwan would need to solve, as in 1988 the nuclear weapons program was at last shut down for good. Well, as far as we know anyway. Chiang Ching Kuo had been in poor health for a few years and passed away in January 1988. The United States was very concerned that the loss of this moderating force would lead to the military seize an even greater control of the nuke program, something absolutely unacceptable. Reagan sent a letter to the new president, Li Tung Hui, demanding that Taiwan's nuclear infrastructure truly be kept for peaceful uses only. In January 1988, a U.S. team was sent to irreversibly shut down Taiwan's research reactor. The most important components would be dismantled and shipped back to the U.S. for destruction. No getting around it this time, the program was done, physically incapable of progressing. The secret reprocessing plant had all of its expensive equipment thrown into the basement, which was then filled with concrete. Taiwan's nuclear research facilities were broken up administratively and politically, so the military couldn't again control it all at once. Physical separation also occurred, with new fences and security checkpoints breaking up sites, making it impossible for anything to happen without supervision. By the end of 1988, Taiwan's nuclear ambitions had been completely crushed. There was no coming back from it this time. And that's pretty much where it all ended. Taiwan has occasionally hinted at restarting the program, but only when tensions with the PRC flare up, like in 1995. Taiwan's security situation remains uncertain, and it's reasonable they would see nuclear weapons as a potential deterrent. The IAEA continues to inspect Taiwan's nuclear sites, making sure everything remains peaceful. As far as publicly available information is concerned, it has. A few minor scares followed, but nothing big, and there's really no evidence Taiwan has actually tried to restart the program. Growing opposition to nuclear energy in Taiwan has also stunted any further development of civilian programs, killing Taiwan's attempt in the 2000s to build another research reactor. Domestic opposition really has been the nail in the coffin for Taiwan's nuclear weapons. Taiwan's program was one of the most advanced clandestine efforts ever discovered, and they nearly achieved their goal. Despite having the technical expertise, economic means, and strategic rationale to pursue a nuclear deterrent, Taiwan was ultimately constrained by its dependence on American support and global non-proliferation efforts.